Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> How the devil are ya? It's episode 75 of the Two Shot Podcast. How are you doing? Are you alright? I hope you're doing better than me. I really do. Let, right, let, let me tell you what happened. So, Sunday, right, I had the day off work. I'm in this hotel, this lovely hotel in London. So I thought I'm going to get up. I had now to do. I had a couple of things to do, but nothing major. I thought I'm going to have a nice lie-in, which I did. I went for a bath. I'm getting out the bath, and I went to pick up the towel, and I must have just turned in a wrong way to pick this bloody towel up, and I twinged the small on my back. So, for the rest of the day, this is what happened. I hobbled to the chemist round the corner to pick up deep freeze cold gel, deep heat rub, uh, bloody muscle and pain heat back patches, and I spent the rest of the day in bed. In agony, so that was a, a a wasted day, wasn't it? And then two days ago, I got this this cold flu thing, um, and last night I slept for ten and a half hours, sweating it out. So after I do this, I'm gonna get the vapor rub in a nice hot bath and have a bit of a steam. So if you're not feeling well, and there's a lot of stuff going around at the moment, so my sympathies are with you. Get a podcast in your ear and snuggle up in bed. That's the best thing. Now, speaking of podcasts, um, apart from this, obviously, I haven't been on other people's podcasts. I've been on two others, apart from last Saturday, where I was invited onto The Cinemile. So if you don't know The Cinemile, check them out at The Cinemile. And the premise is brilliant and very simple. It's Kathy and Dave, who are a married couple. They love film, love it. Watch a little bit too much telly, I think, for my liking. They watch a lot. I don't know how they do it. But what it is, is they go and pick a film, they go see the film, and then afterwards they get the microphones on, they hit record, and then they talk about the film on the walk home. It's brilliant. We went to see Can You Ever Forgive Me um, with Richard E. Grant. Come on, please win the Oscar. And Melissa McCarthy. Yes, please. Um... And we had a lovely, lovely time. They're so lovely. Really nice couple. And I had a brilliant time. So a massive thank you to them. Check out The Cinemile. Uh, I think you'll really like it. Another shout out, right? Do you, for everybody that follows us, you, you will have noticed that an amazing site called Podcast World Cloud. Podcast Word Cloud. See, it's because I'm not very well. Um, after every episode of the Two Shot Podcast and many others, many other brilliant, brilliant podcast. What they do is, well, they make a podcast word cloud. They take little words from the episode and they make this beautiful cloud in fantastic colours and they put it out. So give them a look, right? If you're on Twitter, they're at P Word Cloud. On Instagram, at Podcast Word Cloud. Dead simple. Go and have a look. And they very kindly sent myself and Griff two mugs this week, which I'm going to get Griff to take a photo of and put on our feeds, just so you can see what they do. But they're really, really top guys. So um, go and check them out. Right. So, sorry for waffling. Here we are. It's episode 75. And it's with Carrie Ad Lloyd from The Griefcast. So it's it's the first time we've got a someone coming on, and we do for the first half we do talk about podcasts quite a bit, which I'm sure you'll like. Now you're going to know, apart from the Griefcast, you'll know Carrie Ad from Ostentatious, the Improvised Jane Austen show, uh, Toast of London with past Two Shot podcast guest Matt Berry. You've listened to that episode, haven't you? Go back and listen to it. She was in Peep Show. She was in Murder and Successful with the mighty Big Tom Davis. Oh, come here. A bit closer. 
I've got big Tom Davis coming on the podcast this year. Shh. Don't tell. We're just talking about dates at the moment, but it's going to be great. So, this is episode 75 of the Two Shot Podcast. Now, I first met Cariad at the British Podcast Awards um, last year where I was reading out the nominees. I can't remember what her... F- she won three. Three awards, and quite rightly so. It's a brilliant podcast. But I was really chuffed because it was one of my favourite podcasts that I'd started listening to. So that's where I first met her. And she's very honest, and she's open, and she's just natural. She is what she is. And you can always tell when people are putting something on. It's like... I suppose it's like a DJ sometimes. You can really tell if they're not being themselves. And the great thing about Carriad is... She kind of always is. So it was lovely to sit down with her. Um, We talk about podcasts. We talk about life, death, comedy. What more do you need? This is episode 75 of the Two Shot Podcast with Carrie Ed Lloyd. I'll see you in a bit. I'm going to run this bath. Beak Street that my... Like my friend, you know Rufus Jones. You ever met Rufus Jones? Yeah, yeah he yeah. recommended it. He says it's really good for self tapes. Oh well, that's good because Spotlight also do it as well, and yeah. they send yeah. it off for you. I and do everything. They? I've never managed to get to Spotlight, as in like I've always found something before I've called Spotlight. Well, if ever you can't get anywhere, Spotlight's really good because yeah. the guy does it, frames it all for you. Someone does the offline, uh, and he goes, "Who's it going to?" Boom, right, it's done. You walk out, forget about it. Oh god, joy. So none of that. Fucking weed transfer, yeah, hassle, it's I know. all sorts of Well, that's why I, this studio, I thought, yeah, because my husband's a filmmaker. Right. So he normally does it for me, but it's just turning into, like, constant rows because he's trying to work, and then I'm like, I don't like it, I think my hair looks funny, can you do it again? He's like, fuck's sake. Well, that's why you should never watch it back. Oh, I have to. Why? <sighs> I don't mind watching it back, and I think it can, I can get, I make it better. Like, it doesn't bother me. But when does when does it come a point where you go? Yeah, that's yeah. I've made it. It will never be. No, I know. It'll never be there. Like, but with us, the problem with the husband, you you too much leeway. But with the studio, or when I've done it before in studio places, I watch it and I'll do about three, and then I'm happy. But with do you know what I mean? Then I walk out. But you're right with with someone you know too well, you can keep going and then you ruin it. Yeah, I never. But with studio, I feel like I can watch it and go, oh, I didn't. My eye was doing that. <laughs> That's what worries me. I watch it like, what the fuck is that hand doing? I'm, what? I thought that was interesting. And I thought, okay, wait, just don't do that with your hand, Carrie. But you know when you when you are filming and you're at work. We started. Yeah. Oh, is this you thought you don't tell people? Smooth. That's so. That's cruel. You think that's cruel? I could be like off the record. Yeah, but the thing is, what I was going to talk. I was going to eat my sandwich. You can eat your sandwich. It's fine. You Jodie guys... Whittaker was eating scones. Oh, yes, yeah, she was. I heard that. Yeah. Exactly. It's fine. Have a okay. bite of sandwich. Because what I was going to. I had no intention of just literally starting like that. I, had I knew you'd started. I had a start. Did he know? So it's about acting suddenly and not about colds. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about colds. I wasn't even going to start talking about acting. I was going to start talking about podcasting. Oh yeah, do that. Because we've never, I've never, mm. we've never discussed that. Not properly, no. And a, f- a few months ago, when we were at that that mm. podcast do, we both discovered yes, that, that was we so both weird. give the guests full editorial control. Yeah. Which I was surprised not that people don't do that. Like when me and you were the only, and loads of people were like, oh, really? And yeah. me and you were the only people going, of course, of yeah. course. How can you not give them full editorial control? Because otherwise, how can you create a really safe space yeah, where people can just let go of any inhibitions and talk about you Everything. Know, some deep personal stuff sometimes? Because my thing, because obviously, so I did the grief cast, guys. And, <laughs> and now you'll plug it in the intro. Um, because it was about death, and because I had experienced a death when I was young. I felt, I always think to myself, and maybe this is where you do it as well, I was like, well, what would I want? And I was like, well, I would want someone to give me control and make sure I was okay with it. So that was my thought. It was like, otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk. And I guess because you're such a successful actor as well, you must think, you can think in that mind frame of like, oh, okay, well, if I was interviewed, this is what I would want. I think that's what's happening. I think helpful. so. I think, why did, why did, that was a hard and fast rule to start. For me, for us, because... I didn't want anybody self-editing. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. As they go along. Yeah. Or, you know, if people come on, certainly not on yours, but I would never want... I hate hearing people that's got an agenda yes. on a podcast. Yeah, and it's yeah. And it's so blatant yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And if it's, if it's facilitated by the host, yeah. then they can both get in the seat. I'm not So when you it. were filming with Brad, like, yeah. tell me 
about? It must have been so crazy. I know, it's those really yeah. shit questions. Yeah, yeah. And you know And also, I think, because I'd read... I love reading interviews with yeah, people, yeah. but I, it's very rare that I get a sense of who they are. Yes. Because it, it all comes back to that, that journalist's point of view. Yeah. And I know so many... I know so many people that felt they've been really stitched up. Well, I've had the same... That's how I felt. Like, I've been interviewed for stuff years ago about comedy and then read it and gone, oh, what? Why have they, you know, gone for that angle or said that or highlighted that or made that the headline, as I think many people have. So that's really how I felt. It's like, I don't want someone to walk out of this, especially because it's talking about, you know, the most vulnerable thing of their life, the loss of someone they loved deeply. I didn't want them to walk away and go... Oh, I don't. I really didn't want to walk away and go. I don't like that Cariad. She twisted things because that would just make me want to vomit co- yeah. constantly. But you see, in, <laughs> in this medium, it can't be twisted. Yeah, yeah. Because of, you can hear everything. We right? can hear everything, and it comes from the source. Yeah, yeah. And also because we go right, you're coming into this. I know it's vulnerable. Yeah. Because we're talking about we're putting switching the spotlight on you. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very uncomfortable immediately. I just sort of realised I was being into. <laughs> I just had a moment of self awareness. I was like, "Oh God, I'm." He's talking to me. Shit, because I'm so. I've literally just come from doing one, and I'm so used to being able to go. Okay, in my head, right. So we're going here. I need to go over there. Make sure we don't forget to say that. Oh, they've said that about their dad. Or I must make sure I get. You know. And I just thought, "Oh God, I don't have to do that." No, you like, don't have to do that. But we're talking just relaxed. before. It- <laughs> You seem very relaxed. Good, good. It's the turmeric juice that there you're you There you go. Me. See, I'll sort you out. Yeah, yeah. But we were talking just in the left orbit very briefly mm. about you saying, because I've just recorded, we're doing two days yeah, of recordings, yeah. and you say that you can only do one I can't a day. do, yeah, I can't do more than one in a day. I did. I tried it. I tried to do two in a day. And, and it depends on the story, because I, I also, I never ask people for the story beforehand, because I want to be the audience. Exactly. So you do, yeah. yeah. So I never, and I often, to my own detriment, don't do look research. Like I won't Google them or anything. Sometimes, obviously, I know them, so it's different. But if I don't <clears throat> know the story or anything, so you never know what you're going to get. And I'm sure I could do two. Sometimes it's not a deeply tragic one, but I, I did two, and it was just I felt at the end. I guess you know I'm not a trained psychotherapist, and I felt at the end like overwhelmed with my grief and their grief and I was like I just made a rule for my these rules that you make when you yeah. make a podcast I thought right never do more than two in a day never do more than three a week because it's just too much and then I feel because mine's such about such an odd thing I think I feel like I'm in the land of the dead too much and I start to feel a bit like oh I, I'm a bit on the other side and I need to remind myself that I'm alive yeah and there's sunshine and everything's actually there's living things and even though the show is I think uplifting and isn't always about death. Yeah, too much of pe- delving in people's pain can be well, yeah, it is tricky hard. for my mental health. I yeah, guess. well, I've I've found that as well. Yeah, yeah. If I've done a, if I've done a few, yeah, and then I have all different people's stories. Yes, like going whirling around. Your around head. In yes. my head. And I, so I, what I've been dealing with this year is how. Is how to filter that. Yeah, how do you how do you do it? I don't know. I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's still really learning. It's really hard. It's really hard because you're so invested in the yeah. conversation, and you don't want it to seem like quote unquote interview. Yeah, you yeah. You want it to seem that it's two people talking. It's a bit like because I feel like the reason I I'm able to do the grief cast is that whenever I went to a party without meaning to, I would find I'd start talking to someone. And it would turn out they'd been bereaved, and we'd have a really intense conversation. But you don't go to parties all the time. Do you know what I mean? So especially not with children. Especially not. Guess, and also, yeah. I'm not. I'm very socially anxious. So I was never very good at going to parties. And um, but so you might like maybe once every couple of months or something. You've been at a party. You had a really intense conversation. And you think, oh gosh, and you've got a couple of months to think about it. And you think, oh, that was interesting. And they said that about their dad, dad. And but when you're doing it as a podcast, as a job, suddenly you're doing that three times a week. And it's like that's never how it used to be. And I guess maybe this. You feel this, like, you're good at talking to people, you like chat, you like conversations, and then when conversations become your job, that's quite a weird... Yeah, the, to protect yourself, to create boundaries. So we both established these rules for ourselves, yeah. haven't we, that make us feel safe. They're well, just that, arbitrary rules, really. Well, yeah, because you, well, you have to make somebody who's coming onto your podcast feel safe. Yeah. But then again, you can't forget to look after yourself. Yeah, that's what I've really had to, especially with my own grief, I've had to be really careful... And um, it goes up and down, as grief does. So there's some, like, I think I would say, <laughs> touch wood, very superstitious. Um, 
I'm quite good at the moment. I'm all right. So I feel like when I'm doing them, I don't feel upset. But at the beginning of the year, I had my dad's anniversary and I was doing grief cast and I was, I found it like, oh, I was, it, I should have stopped doing them. But you know what it's like? It's hard to book them in. It takes ages to organize. Yeah. You wake up on that day. And then part of the grief cast is, I feel like, well, I often start and go, well, I'm not in a good place today. So that's, you know, that's where we're coming. Like, I, I think that's better for the listeners to, rather than Carrie, I'd always being like, I'm fine. My dad tried 20 years ago. And do you know what? I'm great. And I did a podcast about it. You can too. Like, that's not helpful. So, it's, no. you know, you, you show the you show the snot and the slime and the mess and the flaws. and Well, I think you have to because it's real. Yeah, that's And it's what, real people. Yeah. These are real stories. It's not, yeah. it's not a true crime podcast. Exactly. And I think that's more, you know, for my guests as well, if they come in and, you know, they're like, oh, I'm in a bad place. And I'm like, yeah, me too. I'm finding it hard today. You connect on that way rather than, yeah, like... But then things can move forward from that. If you're honest from the outset... Yes, massively, yeah, yeah. Like, I stupidly, a few weeks back, we were both very busy working, myself and Griff, and I'd booked in five episodes (laughs) in a 24-hour period. No, it's too much. It's too much. And you know what? I I absolutely burnt out. Yeah, I don't think... There was only... The, the, basically, the episodes weren't affected, but I was affected. Yeah. Oh, I, I did episodes that were affected. That's what got me. I started listening to them and I was like, I can hear, because you know yourself. I was like, you're not listening. You're worrying. You're thinking about your dad. You're trying to keep your tears back. Like, that's not fair on that guest. And so, I, to be fair, I'm sure if you listen to the episode now, you wouldn't be able to tell. No, but you can but tell. I can tell. Yeah, so that's what I then said to myself, right, carry out. If you're not okay... Don't do it. Don't do it. Cancel them. It's okay to cancel a fucking podcast. It's a podcast. I know. It doesn't matter. But I think, especially from, you come from the acting world, don't you? Like, it's got to get done. The show must go on. You do it. Um, but if you're not in a good place, you're not in a good place and you shouldn't do it. I wouldn't. Yeah. If, if I wasn't in a good place, I, I think, if, in all honesty, what I would probably do is I would, you know, I'd book the person in and we'd yeah. start. And then I'd probably try and stop halfway through and go, <laughs> Do you, know, do you know what? This just isn't, isn't working. It's not working. And it's me because yeah. I'm not in a good place. Yeah. I think that's what I would do. Yeah. Because I would be a bit, no, we've got to do it because I feel a responsibility that we go out every Thursday yeah, I know. and people expect it. But it's, it's like, hard. it's just a fucking podcast. And that's the thing I think sometimes we, well, we're learning, aren't we? Because this is a new medium for everybody, is that podcasts, it isn't radio. So it doesn't have, you know, you can have a much more real conversation. It doesn't have to sound perfect and you can have weeks where it doesn't work or weeks where i know you guys like you you just put that music up and stuff it was really nice yeah because i didn't well i you know i'm dead honest with everybody on this because i think it's the only way forward and i had an episode to put out and i fucking lost it (laughs) and it's the first time it had happened in you know 60 odd episodes it's bound to happen at some point yeah and then as luck would have it there was a a lovely ukulele yeah, troupe beautiful. playing in the hotel, and I beautiful. spoke to them, and they did it, and it was, it look, it's a little moment. Yeah, it's I nice. think, but again, I think that's the thing of understanding what a podcast is, especially a weekly one, but on a loose topic, and going, it's not as well, the way that we do our podcast. It's not a series. It's not an arc. It's not a produced narrative. Which I love those podcasts. Yeah. They're great, but that's not what I I can't do. No. That it's it's chats on a topic. So yeah, if the chat that week is you know, not there. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. And I think I've learned to be okay with the mistakes of it because I used to worry so much about... What, that it had to be I wanted perfect. it to be so perfect, yeah, cause, because I came from doing lots of radio and I would listen to things and go, oh, it doesn't sound right. But then I... The reason the show happens, I'm sure you feel this about Griff, is my editor, Kate Holland. Like, once she agreed to become my editor, my world changed because all that pressure of the technology that I just didn't understand. I had someone who was like, no, that's not what a WAV is, carry out. Or, <laughs> or where did you put the microphone? And uh, did you press, and do you check the levels? And me being like, what are levels? Oh, the amount of times yeah. he used to do that to me when I we know, first started, I when know. I would record diff, it's all getting a bit podcast geeky. Know, it? Probably right. people have switched off, it's fine. <laughs> I don't care, it's fine. I would, he said, have you done your levels there? And then I, I, I said, recorded it, it's fine. Then I sent him, he went, no, there's nothing there. You have to send the WAV part. I know, oh, what is I that? Know. And so it's just about learning, though. It is, and also, I, I really like, it feels very cottage industry. So I like that feeling of, like, it feels like we're literally making something with our hands, even though we're not we're using our voices. But it feels really organic. I know it sounds awful. It feels really, like, 
human and natural. And when, you know, you listen to a podcast, it sounds a bit homemade. I like homemade cakes. I don't like cakes that look perfect. I like cakes that look like someone baked them in their oven. You know what I mean? And that that's how I feel about the podcast. Yeah, I know what you mean because... Sometimes, because we record, do you record in like one specific place all the I time? I do, yeah. I record at Whistledown Studios mainly. Occasionally I can't use it because Buddy Radio 4 book it. But um, yeah, basically I live at Whistledown Studios. You're very we, kind to me. We kind of go around yeah. everywhere. But one of our main bases, if we're not in a hotel in London, that there's the Maison Berteau Cafe. That I we was have. a bit sad we weren't at Maison Berteau. Oh, were you? Yeah. Because I love my cake so much. Oh, we'll go back and I'll buy okay. you a cake. Because I looked at the address and I was like, oh, I'm going to get such a good cake with Craig. And I was like, hang on, where's, there's, there's not the cafe in Soho. I'm sorry. Don't be silly. But because we have... Got a pret sandwich and a turmeric juice. Uh, you're all right. <laughs> but we have little, like, you know, teacups oh, and in the background. And it's lovely. kind of nice yeah, because nice. I think it paints a picture for the listener. I, like, I was listening to one the other day and someone just came in and you were both like, hello. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so when I was at school... <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's, yeah, it's nice. You feel, it feels real. And I think that's a, like a new type of audio, which is really exciting. But if, if the topic, if our podcast were topic based or it was a series and yeah, it was yeah. about something oh, week yeah, to week, yeah. doing it in that, the environment um, connects with the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So to do that at Maison Bateau, a fucking true crime or, or some yeah. story yeah, that I was yeah. doing over six or seven weeks. It just wouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, but that's why I love podcasts so much because I listen to some that are so highly produced and I love it. I have no problem, but I like that we can all exist. Whereas at the moment in radio, really, it's a very distinct style of comedy, for example, that exists on radio and it's quite hard to get anything else p- through those doors. If it um, doesn't fit that Radio 4 mould Yeah, type that of thing. style and that tone and the, sa- like the sound. And I think if you don't listen to a lot of radio, it's hard to pin down. But I can listen within two minutes. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a Radio 4 comedy. And that's what I like about podcasts. It's like it feels like at the moment, it feels like anyone can... Fu- I can swear here, can't I? Sorry, <laughs> so but- it's actively encouraged. <laughs> okay, good. Like, it feels like anyone can fucking do it. It doesn't feel like... It feels very... Um, not utilitarian, but like, you know, fair. It just feels very fair that... The, the messy ones can live us right next to the ones that are produced with loads of money and we can all be judged exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's why I, I, lo- I love anything that levels. That's why I like comedy so much. It just levels everyone. I don't care what, what university you went to or how you talk because basically it's, are oh, you making me laugh, really? Although you can get into unconscious bias, but let's not go there. <laughs> well, not yet. Anyway, not, not yet, so I know, early. I know. I do go, I go deep very early because uh, it's grief class. <laughs> Switch off the grief. Curve. Yeah, yeah. Do you, are you good at switching off? No, I'm terrible at it. Yeah, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> I, I mean, not just involved with grief cast, but in, in just life. Just in life, yeah. I'm, no, I'm a very anxious, over brain ticking, too much person. Yeah. I don't know if I come across like that. I think if you really know me, you know, like it's a constant whirl of anxiety and neurosis. And uh, yeah, I can worry about everything, like and anything. So I find it really hard to switch off. But that's why I like doing comedy. I find I switch off when I do improv like my brain just literally oh, bless you i'm so sorry <laughs> it's real it's real guys it's real. <laughs> he like, does have a cold he has a cold god he really he's doing such a good impression of an actor with a cold <laughs> skills, um skills. it's really good yeah when i do improv my brain switches off which is why i think i'm like addicted to it because it's like i guess if someone drinks and they don't think when they're drinking i don't have that but when i do improv i forget <laughs> does something else take over then yeah like the story takes over and the improv takes over and it's like I'm, yeah, it's like my, because, you know, I used to teach improv quite a lot. And when you're improvising, you will say to people, that part of your brain that's saying, you're shit, you're crap, don't say that. Look at the way they're looking at you. Oh my God, what the fuck? Everyone hates you. Also, your shoes are rubbish. Like that has to be switched off. Otherwise you can't hear the story. So I always used to say to people, that voice, you have to literally volume knob, turn it down. So there's silence in your head so that when anyone says anything, you're like, okay, he's Lord um, Hardcastle. He's got a uh, daughter that needs to get married and I'm playing the sister of her best friend. So you, you have to have more, you know, you just can't do both. And I find that it's like a piece for me when I'm improvising. That example was from Ostentatious because I do. Okay, so I thought, what a weird improv example because I do a show called Ostentatious, Improvise Jane Austen. So it's like, 
it's which like people it, just shout out. Is it, is it they just shout out from the audience? No, no. well, so we it's improvised again. I am a fucking geek, so it's it's improvised long form. Don't apologise for I that. I know, I know. So short form is like who signs it anyway style games where people shout out stuff and you're like oh, Napoleon. Oh. Prostitute. <laughs> That's what they don't. Please stop shouting that in pro shows. It's really annoying. Um, anyway, long form is where you're telling a story, and the way ostentatious works is um, you get given a slip of paper that looks like an old penguin book, and you write down a forgotten title of a book. So it doesn't have to be Jane Austen pun, but we've had like Mansplain Park, Queer Eye for a Regency Guy, Strictly Come Darcy, Double O Darcy, um, Mansfield Jurassic Park. You know, these are just some, and then we get shout outs at the beginning we have about three or four and then we just choose one and that's it no more shout outs and then we just do the story just like that yeah then we just make we just do it basically a comedy play in the style of Jane Austen for 90 minutes but really once you understand improv you don't the shout the constant shout outs are to prove you're making it up and improv has moved to a new place now which is really exciting it's like not, there's nothing wrong with short form I still do it at the comedy store with the comedy store players I love it but long form allows you to go I don't need to prove I'm making it up I am look yeah. here I am doing it and I don't need you saying oh do it like it's a film noir for me to you know so we just do it in the style of Jane Austen in full regency gear with a violinist and piano accompanying us and that's it then we just do it I'm, I'm gabbling to explain it because I'm so used to explaining it. No, I, but <laughs> I, I know like, there'll be so many people that haven't. Heard that's what about I realised. I was like, I haven't explained what it is. It is a bit of an odd thing. So we we're in the West End now. So we're we monthly at the Savoy, and we just announced we're going weekly uh, at the Fortune Theatre next year. So. How are you juggling all these things at the moment? Badly, and, and badly, being a mom? <laughs> badly, badly. Yeah, too much. It's too much. I had a bit of a. I was in a play in October when I saw you and then I was also still trying to do grief casts while doing a play whilst <sighs> co-writing a panto whilst doing a channel four thing um and doing ostentatious which is like another of my babies so yeah I uh ever feel you take on too much <laughs> yep might maybe <laughs> I think again it's that thing of trying to stop your brain because my brain's so busy so it's like the more things I do you know and I don't know if this is coming from being more of a comedy actor like there's always this like you make your own work you've got to make your own work so you're making your own work and then you get other work but you can't stop the other work that you've made because that's the stuff that keeps yeah going so that's the thing that like made you is the fact that you can go i don't need anyone i can produce something and then it's you can't just stop that because someone goes oh will you be in my play or my film or my tv show you're like yes but also i must keep that going because when you stop asking me to be in a TV show, there'll be nothing. And so that needs to keep going because that that's keep where going. it all started and what it brings. Yeah, work. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's hard. It's hard to not. You're bit. You're on a bit of a treadmill, and it's sometimes hard to notice that you are on the treadmill because that's just your life. So yeah, I'm. I'm planning a quiet Christmas. <laughs> is that? Is that? Would you? Are you good at saying no? And um, no, I'm terrible. No, I'm terrible. I'm terrible at. I'm Why terrible. is it? Because because you're terrified that it will all stop, or yeah, I um. <laughs> I for ye- I didn't really get to do what I wanted to do until I was about 28, 28, 29, 27. So I still have the fear that I'm not going to be allowed to do what I want to do because it was so hard to do what I want to do. And I'm <clears throat> very good friends. I would say best friends, people laugh. My best friend is Sarah Pascoe, um, who's also stand-up, and we you know, came up at university together and just thought so we're just trying to be actors and performers and not getting anywhere so we both really find it hard to still say no because there's still that voice in your head that's like oh my god so and so wants me to do this um like a a little read through for free at this really cool theater like you can't there's still that little actor in you that's like they want me to say words (laughs) okay (laughs) me me." yeah and it sounds contrived because then people go oh well you've got you're doing so well or something you're like it never feels like that obviously and also my best friend Sarah Pascoe, look how well she's doing. <laughs> she's amazing. She does. She's so prolific and works so hard. So I always feel like, oh, there's always more I could be doing. Um, so yeah, I just find it really hard. But I'm trying to get better. I've, and since having a baby, I've got better. Definitely a lot of the crap. I've just gone. No, I'm not coming to do your unpaid improv gig to six people. Like, well, you have to balance it, don't you? Yeah, know, yeah. What, what's, I well, know we all need to put food on the table. Yeah, and yeah. Buy the nappies, but it's like. It's tricky. And my, what I think, <laughs> we're going really psychology here, but <clears throat> my dad was self-employed. He, like, he ran his business from home. So I am very used to, like, I grew up watching someone not going to bed. Like, you'd wake up and he'd, you know, he's still in his home office and 
you know, four o'clock in the morning, he's just walking around, he's typing, he's dictating something. So I think that's normal. I think it's normal to be on your laptop for as long as you physically can because you've got to bring, you've got to pay the bills. And obviously when you're self-employed, you never know when the next place it's coming from yeah, and you have exactly. no security. So that to me is my normal. So I, he was a workaholic hundred percent and I definitely have picked up that way of surviving of being like, that's how you survive. You just work, 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 work. And I'm, I am trying, I've definitely got better. I'm trying to sort of go, hang on a minute. Are you happy? And I think, yeah, not, I need to get better, <laughs> get better at that. But it's hard. It's just hard. And then sometimes you say yes to the shit job and it turns out to be brilliant. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? You never know. <clears throat> you never know. But the gut, the gut will try and guide you yeah, as best it can. I've definitely tried to get better at listening to myself and just being like, do I feel sad when I've written that email saying, yes, I'll do that? <laughs> like, do, am I like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. There's a little part of me. A little part of me just died, yeah. And so then I try and, yeah. But it, it, what's hard, I think, is once you get into a busy period, I find it hard to come out of that. Do you know what I mean? You have this moment, it's like, oh, all these projects are happening at once. And then to sort of go, oh, well, now they've stopped. I'm not very good at going, oh, that's good, they stopped. I'm like, oh, I better fill that gap with another project. Shit. <laughs> and it's like, no, yeah, you're not doing the play. That's okay. You don't yeah. have to do the play. I suppose sometimes, though, when you're doing, specifically you, when you're doing all these different things, and they are very different. It's so different, So if you yeah. are filming or you are doing ostentatious or you are doing the podcast, they're, they're different things. Yeah. So you're putting a different head on. Which is really exciting. Yeah. And partly why I, I didn't want to work in an office doing the same thing every day. That was the whole thing. I was like, I want my life to be exciting and stimulating. But it's like, it's a bit like Technicolor. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I might need a break from this. <laughs> like how bright this is. And they... They are all really different. And again, that's someone said to me, like, oh, why have you made this choice? And I was like, it's not a, <laughs> not a choice, just like what happened. Yeah. Like things that in, things that interest me, I just follow. And and sometimes they, they snowball and they yeah, become and sometimes they don't. much bigger. This keeps dropping. Really I know, time. Because <laughs> like sometimes they don't, and people go, oh, you've done all these strange different things. But you're like, yeah, but you haven't heard about all the other, there's plenty of other projects that didn't get off the ground because <laughs> they were shit or they didn't work or. You know, these are just the things that got off the ground. But sometimes things don't work. Yeah, which is uh, fine. Which is fine. But that's what you're throwing. You're throwing like 25 balls into the air and then you've got five left. And everyone's like, oh, that's a lot of balls. You're like, you should have seen how many I started with. <laughs> yeah. It was fucking loads. <laughs> this is just everything that's like somebody went, I like that. And you're like, well, I'm such a like sort of, I think coming from such a comedy background, it's like, they liked it. Do it. Do it more. Do it bigger. And anything they don't like, you're like, okay, chuck it, throw it, kill it, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, I don't have that kind of artistic, no, they're just wrong and they'll, they'll catch up with me. I'm like, fuck it, it didn't work, move on. Yeah. Do you like this? It's shiny, do you like it? Great, okay, more of that, more shiny <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know, I like it as well. Like I say, it's very stressful and when, it, when it's too much, it's, it's stressful. But when it's balanced and you somehow manage to go from doing an improv gig as a Jane Austen character to interviewing someone fascinating about their grief and their loss to the next day, you know, acting in a play that you think the writing's amazing, everyone in the play is brilliant, the directing's great, and you're in this great venue. That's it's, that's brilliant. That's the life I wanted. It's just sometimes it's a bit stressful. <laughs> that's do all. you sleep well? Um, I do, I think, because that's I didn't quite used to. A general yeah. question, but. No, I know what you mean. And sleep and mental health are obviously well, yeah. connected. I, I do because I'm so tired. I think if I didn't have... When I didn't have the baby, I used to be a real night owl and I would stay up working till like two in the morning. But now, fuck that. You've got to get up at six. <laughs> like, it's... That's actually really helped. And I have quite a noisy neighbour as well and we just don't care because we're just so tired. <laughs> like, he literally he listens to the boxing like full volume at like four in the morning and I just wake up and I think, oh, he's got the boxing on and I go back to sleep. <laughs> Cause I, and I think it's good... If we'd lived, we moved house, and I was like, oh, if we'd moved before having a child, I'd be infuriated. I'd be yeah. like, he's ruining my life. And now I'm like, I'm just... Children tire you out in such a different way. Like, well, the tiredness I have for looking after her is so different. It's mental and physical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even though sometimes when I get really tired, if I start thinking that I can't switch off my brain... Yeah. Then that snowballs, and I'm, then I'm mm. worried that I can't switch off. Oh, God, yeah, and I do I'm, have that. Then I'm looking, going, oh, it's two o'clock. Yeah. Oh, it's three o'clock. I, I, I get to... up and read. If it's, It's happened to me recently. I said it got a bit much. Everything got a bit overwhelming. And I used to meditate 
or read or do pages? Have you had a morning pages from the artist way? No. So the ar- explain to me. <laughs> so the artist way is this. I would say book that changed my life. It's by a woman called Julia Cameron. And she's an ex-alcoholic, so it is a 12-step programme for creativity. <laughs> and she kind of nicked, I think, a lot of the AA steps of looking at yourself and working out why. But it's about working out... Um, I'm just gabbling again to explain something. It's about working out why you're creatively blocked or what's happening with your creativity or what your process is. And it doesn't have to be be writer, dancer, actor, painter. Just getting you being creative. And um, one of the the thing she says that you have to do is every morning you get up and you do morning pages and morning pages are three. You have to handwrite them three sides. It can be a four, just a notebook, whatever. You just have to do three complete sides without thinking. And it's the first thing you do. And I, when I did the artist way is when I wrote my first Edinburgh show, like it changed, it changed my life. And then I went to Edinburgh and I got nominated and I got an agent. And before that, no, nothing was happening um because you were blocked creatively or... yeah I think because I was blocked creatively and and I was not doing what I wanted to do you know I was confused and lost and trying to work you know and I was just lots of reasons for me but yeah she works out like you, she goes through like school stuff and not the Simmons this podcast of like what what is it that's stopping you and even and it could even be you can do it when you're extremely creative and be like oh am I stuck in a rut like where do I want to go but the morning pages are just an amazing tool because you just you she calls it your self censor you end up writing like oh I'm shit and this and this and this and then I think in the act of writing it you look at it and you think that's not fair that's I don't why am I being so horrible to myself but in your head it's very easy to have a silent argument but to have to write down and often you write down the same problem every day so for like three weeks you might be writing down this person has done this or this this and then you start looking and you think God, I really should talk to them, shouldn't I? It's obviously really bothering you know, it just it's like it's like mini therapy kind of thing. And I did it every day for like five or six years. Now I've had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get up early to write some shitty pieces of paper? No. I don't. But when I can't sleep, it's a really good way. You just write three sides, just handwrite them, and it just get whatever's going on the ticking in your brain is what I call it. Whatever's ticking, it's just on the page. And, and it's it, come out, you've got it dumped. out of your system. Yeah, it's dumped, it's out of your system, and you think oh well there it is it looks silly now or or that's not so bad or you think oh that's i need to talk to someone actually or you know not even therapy i just need like oh i probably need to have a chat with that friend they've clearly upset me or i'm overreacting but it is different when it's written down to what it is in your head yeah or or if you if you actually speak it out loud and have that conversation with whoever it is and i think just the act of writing the act of doing something creative to express what's happening in your head starts teaching you how to write things down as it's not just for writers but it's an incredible incredible tool and i i can't make i will caveat that the book is very god heavy and quite american and some people don't like that but i'm always i'm a pick and choose girl so i'm just like just take what you like from yeah. it um and but you know she says that's she's like you don't have to call it god whatever you want to call it just a higher power that moves you creatively which sounds very hippie-ish i guess but, but also if you read something like and i'm gonna have to have- Reminds me of a book that I read a couple of years ago, and I'll I'll have to find what it is and put it in the, yeah, the yeah. intro. Um, but there was only certain sections of it that really spoke to me. Yes, there was quite it was quite there was a lot of CEO type uh, of speaking. Yes, it. yeah, yeah. But yeah. there were things that pinged out were yeah. brilliant. So you do have to pick and choose. Yeah, I'm exactly yeah. the same because not. And also, some of that CEO stuff might work for somebody else, exactly. but it don't work for me. Exactly, that's a very personal thing. Yeah. so you take. What, um, what's going to be useful yeah, to you yeah. and stick it in your tool bag. And I think it's, it's a, like, if you don't live your life like that, you end up missing out on a lot of stuff. If you're like, oh, well, she's mentioning God, so I don't want to read this book. I'm like, oh, you're going to miss out on, like, two really good pearls. So maybe just ignore the stuff that winds you up. And don't <laughs> but, put yeah. a block on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, it's, yeah, it's a fascinating book. And, it, yeah, it's a 12-week program and you just you do different exercises. Like, every Sunday you just sit down and have to write and answer different questions. And by the end of it, I wrote an Edinburgh show. And I realised, like, oh, I'm trying to stop myself. That's what's happening. I'm self-sabotaging and I'm afraid. And, oh, OK. And once you know it, you're like, oh, OK, well, now I can, I can go and do that. I can go and yeah. fix it. So, yeah, re- I would say, like, I fundamentally changed my life. I'm a bit evangelical about it. So, speaking of Edinburgh. Yes. What did come first, the comedy or the acting? The love of what? Um, acting was always first, always. Like, when I was a kid, like, my parents... It always sounds very middle class, but my mum isn't at all. But they would take us to the theatre um, all the time. But we would go and see, like, 
Arisi and Shakespeare and all was musicals. Was this in London? You grew up in London? I grew up in London, despite the very Welsh name. I am not as Welsh as some people would like me to be. <laughs> Do even Michelle can I? Um, <laughs> that means I don't speak Welsh for people who get upset. Um, but my dad's side are Welsh, but they moved to London. Um, so we would go to the theatre all the time. So I thought acting was acting like I didn't know you could do anything else right. so I thought if you said you wanted to be an actor that meant you wanted to play Lady Macbeth and go to Stratford upon Avon like what, what else is there so I definitely wanted to be an actor and then we would but we would obsessively watch comedy in my house obsessively uh, I just didn't know it was a job I just didn't I didn't think I thought well those were those people they got to do that I don't think anyone could do that whereas acting it was like no you go and you're like it's like a vocation you can do it but nobody said there's a comedy school like I didn't know what Edinburgh was with yeah. they never took us to the festival um but we would just go and see shows all the time so I was very like theatre literate from a young age and that's what I just thought was it both was it your mum and dad who had that passion for theatre? yeah they just they really liked going to shows like I said my mum is extremely working class but she she married well she did well that's what I say in the family and um, so I think my dad's side is more like it's what you do you take the children to the theatre and my mum loves a show she just loves a good show you know and so yeah she we just and we lived in London and we it lived was accessible at, yeah we lived in the suburbs so you just jump on the tube and then by the you know time we so my one of my earliest memories is being um, I think I was about four, and I went to see Macbeth at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. At four. At four, and I saw Nicola McAuliffe, who I still and she was um, trying to get the blood out, and they had f a flame on the stage, and she had her hands in the flame, and like, I can remember I've got tartan blanket over me, and we were right near the front. Like my dad was always a bit like, gotta get best tickets. So we were right near it, and I was like, <gasps> and I thought, she's killed them, and the, she's trying to burn her hands, and it won't come up. And I remember thinking, what will, she, what will she do? What will she do? And I just thought, I was completely gone. Like, I was hook, line, and sinker. And I thought, that's what I want to do. Like, at that's, four years at old? At four, yeah. I was wow. like, but I really thought, it, it, yeah, it, I, it's really what I wanted. But I just thought, oh, you know, how, how does one do that sort of thing? I, nobody in my family is theatrical like they liked going to theatre but not as there's no there's no that's thing. where it stops yeah oh my god my grandpa was um a very good orator he was a solicitor and he uh, we've got recordings of him speaking and he's in i mean he sounds like richard but it like it's the welsh one it, it's insane how good a speaker he wow. is it's like i almost i wish i could just play it to people because he does this speech and it it's like a it's a pure lesson in how to you know hold a crowd it's just so yeah, he's incredible. So he was a performer in that way, but yeah, he was a solicitor. He was a lawyer. He wasn't. There's no. There's no acting ever in any of them at all. Sometimes they're the best actors. Oh, he and he used to get drunk and say, "I could have been John Gielgud if I'd wanted." <laughs> Kelly, I could have been John Gielgud. But he also used to say, "We could have been Sainsbury's because his dad owned a sweet shop and they sold it. If we'd held on to the sweet shop, we could have had a sweet shop in every town in Wales. We could have been Sainsbury's, as rich as Sainsbury's now. It would have been Lloyd's on every corner." And I was like. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so he had, he had quite a lot of theories about what he could have been. He's actually a very sex successful lawyer. So, yeah, I, the comedy came much, much later. I thought comedy was uh, very silly, not important, not worthwhile. And because I would say my family is very, my family's very funny and we're very good at making us, each other laugh, I thought, and that sounds arrogant, I don't sound arrogant, but I thought comedy was easy. It's easy to accents, it's easy to make people laugh, it's easy to put on a silly voice, become a character and do something silly. Like, it's easy, easy. that's easy. What's hard is doing Lady Macbeth and right. putting your hands in the fire. It's so, the quote-unquote real, real acting. acting. Yeah. So I thought comedy was, like, not proper. God. It wasn't proper at all. And it took me, since I was 28, to go, I think what you have is a skill at comedy, and that's valid. I just thought it was, it was really worthless for so long. I just thought it was, what a, who cares? You know, and I didn't I remember doing a, a read through once and someone said, how how are you doing that? And I said, what? And they were like, that that t you're doing something on that joke. It's not funny and you're doing something. And I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, I'm just I'm just saying it like and I thought, oh, maybe he can't make that. <laughs> maybe he doesn't know how to make that funny. I thought, why doesn't he know how to make that funny? Like, just, you know, just do that and that and it will be funny. And I started thinking this sounds really arrogant, but I, I just thought I started accepting, oh, perhaps it's. Perhaps it's a thing that I can do rather than... But it doesn't sound arrogant because there's a real skill to yeah. comedy. And being a... I don't want to say a comedy snob, but somebody who grew up 
uh, which is all I ever wanted to do was do a comedy. Really? Absolutely. That's so fun. It's always the way we all everybody wants to do the other thing. I mean, so many comedians who want to be actors, and all the actors are like, "I'd love to do stand up." But I grew up, you know, <laughs> watching Harold Lloyd and oh, wow. uh, Lauren Hardy and yeah. Bree getting into it and going, oh, they did that there oh, and really wow. yeah, yeah. trying to strip it all away and and look exactly why that's funny. Yeah, yeah. So much so that it became quite obsessive. I definitely had that, but I didn't think... I don't know, like, I would watch stuff, but I would just... I felt like I just knew. I was like, oh, I see what they're doing. They're doing that. Okay, that's... Oh, so if you want it to be funny, you need the tone of that means to do that. And I would watch Julie Waters and Victoria Wood a lot. And I was very very into them and very into like oh I see you know if you that phrasing that Victoria Wood would do and the referencing you know some if you add you know a shrug a, a shrug a jumper and a biscuit you've somehow got a character and I was like oh how oh, that's interesting you know but I don't I was never really I just didn't think it was any on on even on the table it was like watching a documentary about doctors it was like oh right that's how doctors do it like, oh interesting I mean I'll never be able I to do that I could never do that yeah, yeah. I, how would ever how would you do that oh very well, nice to know so what did you want to do when you were at school? And how was school? <laughs> Just now we're, 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 we're slipping backwards. We're slipping backwards. I know, sorry, I jump around. No, 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 that's what I do. It's what we should do. Um, yeah, school was fine. I didn't like it. I didn't really like it, but it wasn't... I don't know, it's really hard to sum up my school sometimes. And I knew you were going to ask me, so I've been thinking about it, because you always ask me about their school. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. I had, um, I had a delightful primary school, like absolutely ridiculous it was it was in the middle of a square was the whole primary school and there was four roads around it and we all literally all crossed the road to the primary school and all our mums were friends and we all so I've still got friends from that square right which and I think sometimes when you grow up in London people don't realize that London is a collection of villages so like if I go back to my hometown my village of London like I still I guess, you know, we all know each other, but people, I think sometimes it's like, oh, London's so huge and horrible. It's like, if you grow up here, it isn't, you know, especially in the suburbs. It's like, everyone knows everyone's business and all the mums know each other and the dads, and then so-and-so's left so-and-so, but their house is going up for a million pounds. All our houses are worth a fortune. That's the one good thing, Um, because we live in London, but we can't sell them. Anyway, um, so my primary school, I think, was lovely. Secondary school was... it's almost, oh, it's, how do I describe it? It's extremely academic school, and I was very miserable there. But if I walked you around it, you'd laugh your head off, because it's, like, such a good school, and people fight to get their children into there still. Like, it's very high up. And it's, um, you know, I will tell you about it. It is a really weird school, because it was actually created in the 1500s by um, <laughs> a dame, and it is part of the guild schools, so it's by the Worshipful Company of Brewers. Right. And it used to be for the poor boys of Islington. And yes, Spandau Ballet, if you're listening, I went to the same school as you, because <laughs> <laughs> Gary and Martin Kemp also went there. And it used to be in Islington for the poor boys, right? And they moved it out to the suburbs, um, and it suddenly became extremely posh, middle-class school. But we had a school song. We used to get beer money at the end of the year. What? Yeah. So, because it's owned by the Worshipful Company of Brewers... <laughs> So weird. So like a guild, you know, like the guild yeah. of like weavers or or you know, copper merchants. So um, the brewers somehow still involved, and at the end, because in the 1500s beer was better for kids for the boys than water, because in London it was cleaner. They used to give out beer money to the poor boys of Islington, and this tradition still maintains. So these men turn up with like ermine gowns and like gold, like they look like all look like mares. And you all have to look your best. And you go at the end of the year. Oh, and we had a school pub. And the end of the year, you you Sounds go. Sounds like a great school. Yeah, what exactly. What you were miserable about? You go in and you have to hold your hand out, and you're not allowed to say thank you. You have to nod your head, and you get a pound in the first year, two pounds in the second year, three pounds, and by like upper six, you get seven quid. But that's like to like two hundred pupils, and we'd all have to go in and and hold our hand out. If you're listening, you know what school I'm talking about, and you'll be. Surprised that I went there. Um, I've spoken about many schools. Yeah, it's really weird. Nothing like this. I know. And we had a school pub that you could drink at when you were 17, so it was a private member's bar, and the teachers and the pupils would all drink there. Together? Yeah. There wasn't a, a segregation teachers? Um, and... So, yeah, you're just kind of all in the pub together because it's the school pub. Because <laughs> it's owned by the brewery. I know, it's such a... Like, I grew up thinking it was obviously very normal. It wasn't until I got to uni and I started being like... People were going, a school pub? Yeah, exactly. And then we had a school song. and So it's like a public school, but it wasn't public school. But it has all the trappings of, oh, his, of history and yeah. tradition. But it was completely not, you know, a state school. 
that just happens to be I don't understand how it works but the brewers are involved in some way so it's but it was also very academic and I wasn't very academic and terrible at drama and I'll say that on the record it's fucking awful and drama was treated as a pathetic secondary not even sec like four like I mean the idiots if the idiots want to do a play good luck to them but it's not music was what you were encouraged to do so they have like this ins- they built this insane like music hall and like orchestral pit and stuff and so like it's the best in the the whole of the county for music and orchestras but so music is held in music is intellectual more, more yeah right, okay of course and so it's a very intellectual school and so if you weren't play if you weren't doing maths or physics or you know playing violin and heading to oxbridge you were not very interesting to them so yeah i found it is that why you found it miserable yeah, I think I was, I sort of got defined as like, I would say like, I used to get B's a lot. I used to get a B plus and like, I still feel it's a chip right. on my shoulder. That was not good enough at my oh school. Oh my God. And so I, you know, I'm a perfectionist anyway. And I went to a school where it was like, if you're not getting an A star, why should we give you our time? And so if you got, yeah, exactly. And the only thing I excelled at was English. It was the only place I was special and I was good. And that's why I ended up doing an English degree because it was the only thing I felt like I was I was worth talking about. That was the only thing in my whole school that they would be like, oh, she got an A star on that. But drama was like, yeah, I mean, I got terrible marks for drama and they just, they didn't encourage us. And acting was like, it just wasn't a job. In their opinion, it wasn't a job. It's not realistic. It's not real. It's not, why on earth would you... Are you are you insane? You're not going to. It's not how you make money, and it's not worthy of your time. So I found, you know, the idea of applying to drama school was like, well, I didn't. They wouldn't even. I didn't know you. Could, I didn't know you could. I didn't. I didn't know you could apply. I didn't know it was a thing. Did I had, you ever start to believe it? Because they're getting that drawn yeah, into it all the time. You think, go, well, maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't a realistic career opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's how I felt. I had no one in my family doing it. I had one friend who I'm still friends with, who's still an actor, and she had had done a lot of acting as a child and she was like, I'm going to drama school. And I remember thinking, oh, like, I thought she was very brave. But also I think we have to caveat this that my dad died when I was 15. So in the middle of this world, the you know, the hugest thing possible happened to me. So in the middle of being a very gothy, angry teenager who feels like, oh, this school's so shit and no one understands me, the, my, the bottom falls out of my world. So then what has taken me a long time to realise is what happens when you lose a parent as a teenager is you become very vulnerable and you don't trust anything because nothing's safe anymore. So the the people go different ways. Some people go off the rails and take loads of drugs because they're like, fuck it, we're going to die. And I went very like, we're going to die. So like, I better not do anything very dangerous or scary. So I'm going to go to university because that's safe. And they've told me that drama school is not safe. So I don't want to be not safe because that's where people die. Okay, fine. So I went into very like, just do what you can to like, survive. survive. <laughs> like, so yeah, I think it's it's very hard for me to talk about school. Not hard, but like it's confusing because when a grief like that happens in the middle of it, how can you really judge it? You know. So for then, you know, that was two weeks before my GCSEs. So I did them, and then I had two years of sixth form at the same school, and I just didn't give a shit. Obviously, my dad, I just didn't. By then, I just was like, well, perspectives. Yeah, perspectives. I just didn't care. I didn't care. And then they would start with the Oxbridge stuff and I just didn't care. I just didn't. Oh, who gives a shit? And now I'm annoyed because I think I wish I'd paid more attention to, oh, Cambridge has this really good drama, you know, foot, there's footlights and stuff. And But I just, I just, I didn't care. I just you didn't were care. dealing with what was going on at that time yeah, in that exactly. moment. And exactly. if you go back and go, oh, if only, if only, then you wouldn't have dealt with it exactly. the way it had and you yeah, the way you are yeah. now. So. Exactly. No, I know. It's just, it's, it's a... Yeah, but I, I wasn't very happy there. But I'm still friends with people that I made that I met there. So you know, it was not, it wasn't terrible. It was just not the right school for me. I think in some ways. So going to university to study English. Yeah. What was the plan there? No plan. No plan. <laughs> no just, plan. Just, let's just do something. It was like what all my, you know. I just was doing what I was told. It was like you have to do GCSEs, then you have to do A levels, then you have to go to university. That's what you do. And later, no, that's all my friends from school. We all went to university. It was like that kind of academic school. It was like you go and get a degree yeah. and then you go and get a job. And if you're not going to work in the city, we assume you're going to be a teacher. And if you're not going to do that, you're going to get married. 
So I was like, okay. okay good housewife. Yeah, you yeah. Go. So I kind of, I was like, well, I just, I took a year out and I did some traveling and then I, um, yeah, I just went to uni because I thought, I don't, I thought I literally don't know what the fuck else to do. Because in the tiny back of my voice was like, you want to be an actor? And I was like, shh, shh shut anybody. up. Yeah, yeah, don't, that's not, that's not an option. So don't heartbreak, that is heartbreaking to think about what I want to do because it's not an option for me. Other people are allowed to do that and I'm not. So I have to just forget about it and walk away. Like a man who doesn't, he doesn't love you. So you just got to walk away. You can't do it. So I was like, well, I'll go to uni then. God, you were suppressing that for yeah, so long. Yeah, yeah. And then the first thing I did was audition for a play. <laughs> <laughs> when you were at uni? Yeah, yeah. Just sort of get out of your system because it's... Well, I was like, I thought it was okay to have it as a hobby. I thought, well, I'm allowed it as a hobby. They can't take that from me. No. I'm allowed to do it as a hobby. And then, you know, I'll become an English teacher, but I'll, you know, I'm allowed to still... And also, you know what? It was really fun. I went to audition for the play and I thought, if I don't get it, then there's your answer. You're not, you're not good enough anyway. And then I got in the play and I thought, oh, okay, well, that's exciting. Dangling the yeah, it was. In front of you. And then I met my two best friends in this play. So I met Sarah Pascoe and Vanessa Hummock, who are still my extremely good friends. And we then started doing lots of, you know, I started doing loads of drama stuff. And I started choosing to study drama and, you know, writing about Shakespeare or, or doing a film court. It was all performance, like, hidden in English literature which was great. Sussex let me do that. So, you know, that was really nice. And then we, we started directing plays and, and it was, it really, honestly, another turning point was Pasco because she was just like, we're going to do it. We're going to be actors. And I was like, what? She's like, we're just going to do it. She's our. And I was like, okay. And I thought, well, I'm just going to follow her because she seems to know, she what, seems to know what what's she's going doing. on. And she said, we won't, we, she, she said after we won't get jobs that are boring jobs. We're going to get performing jobs. Cause she'd worked as a singer in like hotel bars and stuff. So Did she, she yeah, she that. worked at the Millennium Dome as well as a performer. Oh, you've got to get a Pasco on. So her life's amazing. And so she was like, you can get jobs that are performing. You don't have to do boring jobs. Was I come from a, you know, you get a job at a bank and that's what you do. So she said, we're going to go and do TAE. And then she got me a job on the buses as tour guide. So we're going to do tour guides because you're performing. You're performing. Yeah. So she was like always, you know, with the old, what was the old um, PR rate? What was that like? She used to have to get it through the post and it would tell you the jobs. Oh. PR something. PCR. Was PCR. It? Yeah, it was always red. Wasn't always it? Or red. Diff- always red. You all different colours. I the... remember red in yeah. my mind. You had to get it through the post. That's yeah. how old we are. And she'd be like, right, there's a job here. And, you know, we'd obviously try and avoid, avoid the escort jobs. But it was always like, what can we ne- do this needs before? Must. Sometimes yeah. you've got <laughs> exactly. to put, put food on the table. <laughs> it was like, what can we do? And then, yeah, I started doing, so I started doing more performing jobs and, and realising. Oh, you can, and then I thought, okay, I can do, I'm not going to be an actor, but I can still perform and earn money. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do these other things, but I'm obviously I'll never, ever do the, what I really want to do, but at least I won't be in an office. But then so I, was your confidence building throughout this or so, was it getting a battering? I don't know. It was getting a battering as well because it was, you know, occasionally do, just doing a series of awful fringe plays as well. I did which so many. Can, which were soul destroying. Sometimes it was. Sometimes they were wonderful. Obviously, sometimes it's brilliant, and sometimes it's six people, and you, you're all shit. And like, as in the people in the you included are shit. Yeah. The play's shit. The directing shit. Your shit. The people you're acting against are shit. And you think they're bad, and I'm bad, and this is bad. And that's you know. I so might as well just give it all up. What, yeah. Bad. yeah, give it up. It's too hard. And then I would temp as well. I did loads of temping. I worked in investment banks. I worked in a place that sold Viagra. I worked in a advertising company. I worked you like on. I just literally went around London in different offices, and um, then but then it was getting into comedy was where the confidence because that was the one place where I was good. So where I mean we've already established where the comedy <laughs> comes from, but it's a very different thing to being such a massive fan and doing a certain style of comedy to... Yeah, it's such a weird, as ever, it's such a weird journey. So I left university and I was looking at courses. So City Lit ran lots of acting courses, but I saw this course that said short form impro. And I thought, well, I love Whose Lines End. That's one of my favourite shows. So I could do a course in it. You know, again, I can't, not allowed to do it, but it'd be fun to do it, yeah. you know. And I did, um, I rang them, they said, we've got no spaces. Oh, okay, fine give up, carry on temping. And then they ran me two weeks later. They said, oh, someone's dropped out. Do you want to do it? And I thought, oh, yeah, why not? You know, be, got nothing else to do. I'm stuck in a boring job. So I went into this short form class. And again, I was like, I was just, I was just good at it. I just got it straight away. I didn't need the games explained. I just knew I understood it. And I, it was again, I'm the first time I was like, oh, I'm good at this rather than like, I'm shit and everyone else is brilliant at this. And then Pasco um, got a job at a show called News Review is still running it's a satirical show at the canal cafe theater so i've been going for 
Donkeys. donkey's years. It's like Guinness World Record for like longest continuous show or something. And she said to me, you've, you've got to do this. It's easy. It's exactly what we do. We just do accents and voices and you write the sketches. You could do this. And I auditioned and didn't get in and felt shit again. And then I auditioned again. I don't think I got in again. I used to literally shake, visibly shake in audition. I was so nervous. And then I think... I, you know, I started hanging around doing impro and then, you know, it's like someone had done impro with, started saying, oh, I'm doing the next news review, I'm directing it, will you audition? I was a bit more confident and I got into news review and then I started meeting all these comedy people who were like, oh, we do sketches. I was like, what do you mean you do sketches? And I met Pippa Evans, who was like, I do character. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? She said, I just put on an accent, like, go to a club and I do the set. And by that point, Pasco was doing stand-up and I was very afraid of stand-up. I just thought, I can't stand there and be myself. I don't like myself. I don't know how to do that. But I know how to put on a hat and do a stupid voice. I fucking know how to do that. So Pippa really changed my world because I was like, I just didn't know you could... I didn't know it was happening. So when she started doing characters, she said, right, there was a sketch I did where I played a young boy in News of You called Andrew. She said, right, you can write 10 minutes for Andrew. And I did Andrew's Guide to the Northern Ireland Peace Process. <laughs> And I had this Doctor Who jump and Andrew talks like this and he used to, he was trying to explain like Catholicism and Protestantism. He had a piece of bread and he was like, some people think the bread is Jesus and some people think the bread is not Jesus. And then they've got very upset. And, and then, yeah, he used to explain, he did that history of the Russian Revolution and stuff. Like it, it just became like, oh, I, here's a voice that I get and I can write about a historical comedy, which is something I know about. So it just kind of went from there and then I started gigging and and then it took me ages to get an Edinburgh show together. It took me ages until I read The Artist's Way and I was like, right, I've got all these characters I should put this into. And did you do that in that first in that first Edinburgh show? Lots of different characters? Yeah, I did six different characters. Or, or just your show though? Nobody yeah, else yeah. In it. No, no, it was a solo show, yeah. yeah. So I'd done all these characters for like two years gigging around London and just doing ten minutes here and there and everyone kept saying, you should do Edinburgh, you should do Edinburgh. I had no, no agent, nothing. I'm still just nothing. I'm just, I'm a receptionist. That's what I'm doing. Were you still doing it? Were you still temping? Yeah, still temping. Like, I was just completely... I had nothing. I absolutely... Like, if you'd met me, you'd have said, that girl is a receptionist. That's what she's doing. Occasionally doing terrible Finch theatre. And then finally, I read the artist... Well, I had the worst summer of my life. I got fired from an Edinburgh show, and he claimed he didn't fire me, but we're still friends, and he did. And <laughs> <laughs> the year before... <laughs> He, he said he wanted me to do his Edinburgh show, a friend of mine, and then he changed his mind. I was working at a call centre with all these actors uh, for ringing charities. It was awful. It's been closed down since because his practices were so bad. And I was washing up a tin of baked beans, and I, you know, you have to, like, rinse it out. I sliced yeah. all my fingers on the tin. I stand there covered in blood. All my friends were in Edinburgh. This is 2010. And I remember just looking at my hands, beating, thinking, your life is so shit. Like, why don't you just, why don't you just do a show? Because it can't get worse, can it? Like, this is, this is, you know, rock bottom. I was like... Did you feel you were I thought, bottom? like, this is, I am, mis all my, and by this point, Pasco's a very successful stand-up. My, all my friends are successful stand-ups. Like, I was the only person not doing comedy because I was still going, I'm going to do Macbeth at the RSC. Right, so you were was still there. It was still there. Wow. So I couldn't get anywhere. And I thought, why don't you just fucking do the show? What's the worst? You can't be any worse than this. This is awful. So then in that summer, I then wrote the show and then got it together, started gigging it. And then in 2011, I took it up to Edinburgh with no agent, barely any PR. A friend wrote my press release. and Because um, it's a very different thing. Yeah. Going around, doing 10-minute slots yeah, here yeah. and there. But to do, I'm presuming it was not like an hour's yeah, show. Yeah, it was an hour's show, yeah. And I just kind of put all the characters together with a very loose theme that I'd booked a variety night and... Um, these were the guests on the variety night, basically. Cariads, Lady Cariads characters, it was called. Yeah, and so Andrew was in there with Jacques Lecoq, who's a French parkour guy. Just of course used, he is. Just to sit on women and go, under toi, pas que. <laughs> he's just flirt outrageously with a woman. Uh, and rap, he's do French rap. And um, yeah, there was Alison, the magician's assistant. And um, oh, Joey Bechamel wasn't in there, that was the next year. Joey Bechamel's the manic pixie dream guy I used to do. He's a very loose spoof of Zoe Deschanel. Um, God, who was in it? I can't remember. Anyway. Oh, an actress character. There was an actress character that was trying to... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Uh, it was basically me, and she was auditioning for TIE, but she was treating it like Shakespeare, and I used to do terrible speeches. So like, I used to do fake Shakespeare and this fake northern woman that, like, you know, I used to say, you know, because um, I want to show my range, I'm going to use an accent. 
So watch out for that. <laughs> and she's 85 because I want to show how good I am as an actor, this character. And, you know, she'd, she'd had an abortion. She'd been abused. Her husband had left her and he'd hit her. And she used to end every sentence with a cup of tea. <laughs> and so it was like a fake audition piece, you know, which the actors like, not everyone else really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, and then I just put it all together. And, and then from that, I got my agent and my world changed. So, did you get nominated that year? I got nominated for Best Newcomer, yeah. And, yeah, and I, you know, no one knew who the fuck I was. It was like, I remember standing at the, I went to the, um, do you have a photo shoot for the, all the nominees like a couple of days before? And people turn up with their agents and their producers, and I was just by myself. <laughs> and I was trying to eat croissant because I'm always up for free food. And there was two women next to me, and they were like, who the fuck is Carrie Ad Lloyd? <gasps> And I was like, oh, God. And I don't know, it's patched on the free fringe. I've never even heard of her. And I was like, what do I, what do, I do? What do I do? <laughs> this is so awkward. And I just sort of scurried off with my croissant. I was like, well, at least you got a free croissant. You got a free croissant. That's oh, fine. God. But it's fine. I mean, you know, I got nominated. So. Yeah. But it was very, it was a really weird, like it was from nothing to 100, you know, like from literally nobody wanted anything to do with me to. People oh, want a piece. Oh, God, yeah. And I had no agents. Of course, everyone was like, like come and meet me come and meet you gonna do this we'll make you a star see kid come this way so it was really overwhelming and then the next year I did another show which was a bit of a disaster because I was sort of still in shock and I had a sh- I'd written you know that show had taken two years to write you're still gigging the other show I was going to do festivals with the other show and then suddenly you've got to write the new one you've got like six months to do it so it was a bit hastily put together the second one but it had its moments do you feel under pressure when you're writing a show you do, Why yeah. Not? It depends. Your first show, I think, is a lovely thing in a way because you just don't know. You just don't know what you're doing. So it's a bit like first love. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, you're just figuring it out and who knows? And then it's wonderful. And then but In a way, there's freedom there as well. Exactly. You, you, I didn't... I didn't. No one knew me. I didn't know what people from the judging, you know, the, the judge... Lots of com- comedians know who's on the judging panel for the big awards. I had no idea. And friends were coming to see my show and they're like, oh, you had four people. And I was like, did I? I don't know who they are. I didn't know how any reviewers were. You know, I did a show to six people once and I think like two of them were reviewers, but I, I didn't know who they were. <laughs> Whereas now I'd be like, oh, there, there they are. Yeah, Hello. Yeah. I've spoken to you. I've met you. And yeah, it was really free and it was on the free fringe and... Was, no. that, was that when the, the free fringe was just starting? Well, no, it'd been, it'd been going a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it just, the year before, Imran Youssef had been nominated on it. So it was like, it was just becoming respectable. Right. It finally, people started going, actually, the other model was really hard. So perhaps this it used to be free fringe was a bit, people were very sniffy about it. And like, well, it's not, it's not where the real comedians are. And then no, it was not like, not anymore. Well, no, it's actually changed. But yeah. I think the year before me, it started to change. My year really changed. And then the year after me, Someone else got John Kearns got was I think one on that year and he was on the free fringe in the same room as I'd been as well. So like it was yeah, it became like a much more oh, this they're completely equal now. And I'd say now there's probably more well, it's equal, it's pretty equal because Did you feel a lot of pressure writing that second show because of how well the first one had been yeah. received? Yeah, I had a horrible time. Like I wasn't very good at the success. I found that really having come from Every door slammed in my face. Nobody, you, you're not good enough to do this dream. That, talking to producers who had actively said, no, we don't want to work with you. And then literally two weeks later, they're like, hey, carry on. You're like, oh, I don't feel like I can trust anything. Yeah. And obviously I have such a hangover of my dad, like the world, things not being very stable. I'm not very good with massive change. It makes me feel very like, oh God, oh God, what's happening? So I felt like suddenly my world was insane and I'd gone from working completely full time at Southwark College, dealing with teenagers breaking down on me because they their EMA been taken away and they can't get their fucking bus and they're not going to pass their GCSEs to go into like this radio meeting and, and being like, what, what, like what's happening? This is just, yeah, it just felt a bit. How did you mad. deal with that? Because there's it obviously it can badly, go one badly. way. <laughs> you can completely shut down or you can embrace it or you can run away. I mean, there's yeah, lots of things. I wish I'd taken more time. I, again, I, I'm quite good at doing what I'm told. So then my agent at the time who were brilliant, but they were like, you need another show and you need to go to the paid fringe and you need to show people like this, is what you can do. And so I, um, I wish I'd taken more time and just, I know other people then, have done different they've like done that show again for another year and not rushed but I was like I've got to I've got to give them something new but then I don't know I got a pilot out of it out of the second show which I loved doing even though nothing came of it it was an amazing experience so you know all of these things yeah they lead to something else they lead you somewhere else you learn from them you feel better for them and finally I was doing what I wanted to do 
And like, so I. You realise what it yeah, was. Yeah, I realised I, I probably want to do comedy. And I care, and I started taking it seriously. But I'd never taken it seriously. And I started thinking, oh, I want, I want to do a show that's funny for these reasons and the technique. And I give a shit rather than going, oh, I just put a hat on. <laughs> I just put a hat on and do an accent, it'd be all right. It's like going, oh, I care. So yeah, that was amazing. That was completely and utterly amazing. And I still am grateful, so grateful that I get to do this and not work in a receptionist where people don't know my name, call me temp. Is there still a part of you within yourself that wants to be that... Actor, l- yes. Lady? Yes. You want to be at the artist? 100%. 100%. Oh, my God, yeah. I like. I think if if somebody said, now, nah, here you go, do you want to do it? I'd be... I'd shit myself. Yeah, of course. I'd think, and I would have to think, actually, is it what you want to do? Because... But you don't know yet I don't know until yet. you do until it. Until I've done it. That's how I feel. That's why I did a, I did a sort of comedy slash serious play in October because I thought, um... Well, I remember speaking to you yeah. about it and you were in rehearsal. Yeah, cause, and, that, and that's why everyone was like, oh, why have you said yes to that? And I was like, because I need to know if I still want to do it. And I loved it. I absolutely loved doing it so much. And I, I don't want to ever stop doing comedy, but you know those some actors, I think, um, you know, Olivia Coleman is like such a good example, Tamsin Grieg, that kind of make that jump over... I don't even like saying it out loud because I think, oh, God, the gods will hear you and say it won't happen. But that's what I'd like, to be able to still do comedy because I love it so much, but not to have people go, oh, you can't do that. You can't do something serious to go, oh, yeah, you, you can come and do that. Some but I think you stuff. can do anything. I think, I think we should all be... A, 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 I know, and I feel like that about the, the other way. Like, when, I, when serious actors come and do comedy, it's great because they bring a different energy to it. It's so nice and... Comedians can be quite sloppy. And when I've done, you know, radio comedies with actors, I'm like, oh, look at them. They're, they're really giving it a character. <laughs> Whereas we can be very, and they're like, I know how to make this funny. So I just say that and it'd be funny. It's quite nice. It's quite nice to have a different energy. So I think, yeah, why not? Why shouldn't you be, a, why should it be so segregated? It's mental. Like being good at comedy is, is, is as hard as being good at Shakespeare. Like they're just Absolutely. slightly different skills. So it'd be nice. To, it would be very nice. Carrie, I'm very sad. <laughs> Very sad because you've, uh, you've got to go. I know I've got to go. Um, got to go. I'm sad too because I think I've waffled. I've waffled well, it's away. It's been really lovely because it's the, even though we've met, Very and lovely. I was and I was so pleased because I was the first person to give you your first podcast award. This I know, year. I know, that? and I was so overwhelmed. And then uh, then you said I'm from Two Shot. I was like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed at that ceremony. Yeah, it was mad. But uh, <laughs> look. There's somebody's bounce. Somebody's at the door. Somebody's this is how door. real it is. Let's just, let's just, keep, let's yeah, just keep, keep recording, see who it is. Hello? Uh, hello, we started to the board, but we got the uh, alarm on the fire uh, board. Can Pre- I have a sorry? check? A fire? Pre alarm. Pre alarm. Oh, Pre alarm. All right. Can I have a check? Everything is okay. Yeah, yeah come yeah. in. Come, come in. in. We're just recording the end of a podcast. Come on, come in. Come in. I'm so sorry. That's all right. What's this your name? Very good character acting. I'm so sorry. It's okay, man. Don't worry. The fire alarm's just here above these microphones. Do you want to give it a little check? It did go off before, before prior to oh. you coming. We could just carry on. And <laughs> it over I just think this is, a, this is really good character acting. This it's is really good. Do you want to come in? This is strong. Try to reset. Is this Mike Lee play? Is this when you, you haven't told me properly what's happening? It's not actually a podcast. This is, <laughs> you, you, I know that you Have love you worked the, with him? I know you love the improvising. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. I'm happy. I'm going to start Carry improvising. On. I'm just going to... We'll just sign it off now because I know you've got to go back. I know, and, and it's not as exciting as it appeared at first, is it? No, it was very dramatic with <laughs> it the It got very the dramatic. Um, <laughs> but... Thanks so much for Thank coming you. on. Thank you for having me. Did you enjoy it? I really enjoyed it. Right. I felt like I waffled. No, you didn't. Okay, good, good. It was lovely. Thank you. Can I call? Oh, can you call? In the phone? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Love it. Bye, guys. And another episode is done. Sorry, let me turn this back off. Right, there we go. What about that? How fantastic is Cariad? Now, look... I'm sure you do, but if you don't subscribe and listen to the Griefcast, it's not all doom and... Well, it is. It is about death. But it is very funny, and it's life-affirming, and it's quite healing, I must admit. So um, do do check out the Griefcast and Podcast Word Cloud and The Cinemile. I cannot recommend all of those highly enough. So a massive thank you to you for downloading and subscribing. You do subscribe, don't you? It's dead easy. Just hit subscribe. 
Um, if you want to give us a review, that's absolutely fine. You can do that. If you can't be asked, then that's fine too. It'd be great if you could, though. Um, so a huge thank you to Cariad, and no doubt I'm going to see her in the not-too-distant future. Uh, well, that's it. I'm going to go. I'm going to have this bath, try and get myself sorted, because I've got four days off work, and I've got 11 days till we start recording some new episodes, and you're going to pop when you find out who's coming on the Two Shot Podcast. We've got some incredible guests lined up. Um, I'm dying to tell you, but I'm not going to do it. And not through teasing, but only because, right, if I tell you and then something happens, like the other day I was supposed to record at five o'clock yesterday and I had this cold and I texted this person and I said, look, I'm, I'm not in a fit state. If I'm not in a fit state, um, I don't want to give you my germs. And also, it's not going to be a good episode, and I really want it to be. So we're going to meet up again in March, when this person is back in the country, and we're going to do it. And it's going to be fantastic. So, thank you so much for being here. And until next week, take care of yourself, alright? Don't be careful when you're picking up that towel out of the bath. You know... Just take care. Don't don't do what I did. You know. Just be careful. Um, so that's it. Until next week, I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff, and this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Take care of yourself. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson. Recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.